Good. A it's, a it's afternoon now, right? Okay. Yeah. All right. Good afternoon. Um, <laughs> open up if you're bi in your Bible, if you would, to Mark 16 to start with. Open up to Mark 16. So, um, I didn't know for sure that I was going to be doing this until late in the evening on Sunday. So I did not have time to put together any kind of a organized PowerPoint presentation. And I'm going to, let me just say this a few things as we get started. There is no way in the next about an hour I'm going to tell you everything there is to know about this, okay? Um, I don't even think we know everything there is to know about this yet. It is an extremely, diff it, it is um, a very complex issue and, and nut to try to crack and figure out uh, all the things related to it, okay? So I basically want to do four things if we have time. The first thing I want to do is I want to kind of explain why we're having this meeting and how we came to know some things about uh, Codex, Vatic or Codex Sinaiticus and why we're having this discussion at all. I want to share with you just a little bit about the research process that we've used. And when I say we, I mean myself and Dave Reed primarily. Um, in, in accumulating this information and going through it. Then I kind of want to give you, if we have time, maybe three or four points to consider about the codex itself. And then at the end, I'll sort of direct you to where you could go for further information and study if you wanted to know more about this topic, okay? But I want to start in Mark 16. Um, so I have in front of me a Schofield Reference Bible. And I have a footnote in my Schofield Reference Bible on Mark 16, verse 9. So if you have a Bible, I don't, probably all don't have Schofield Bibles. How many of you have a footnote in your Bible, even if it's a King James Bible, on Mark chapter 16, verse 9, directing you to the margin or the footnote in some way? How many of you have a note like that? Okay, let me just read you mine. Mine says... The passage from verse 9 to the end is not found in the two most ancient manuscripts, the Sinaitic and the Vatican, and others have it with partial omissions and variations, okay? So what this note is doing is it is suggesting to you or calling into question whether or not Mark chapter 16 verses 9 through 20 should really be in the Bible, okay? And they're doing that based on what authority? Let me read it to you again. Pay close attention to what they say. The passage from verse 9 to the end is not found in the two most ancient manuscripts. Why are they saying you should, have, you should question whether or not those verses should be there? They're saying it based upon the authority of, first of all, how many manuscripts? Two. It doesn't matter. There are thousands of others that have the verses in them. Okay. And the reason these two are particularly important, they say, the two most ancient what? Manuscripts. So they're saying that the reason why Mark 16, 9 through 20 should not be in, in the Bible is because the two oldest manuscripts that we have don't have those verses in them. Okay? So they're, they're, they're calling that into question. Now I know most of you here are aware of that already. Okay? So I have in front of me, I brought with me a bunch of stuff, but two of the things I brought with me, this is my copy of the Texas Receptus. Okay? This is, this is the Greek text that the King James Bible was translated from. Those of you that have been through the school and manuscript evidence, you know this, right? Okay. But I also brought with me a, this is an 1882 first American printing of the West Cotton Hort Greek text in America. Okay. This contains in it an introduction by Philip Schaff. In the introduction, he talks about the process that they used and he spends a lot of time talking about the two most ancient witnesses, the Sinaitic Codex and the Codex that's in the possession of the Vatican. Okay? So I, I, I want, I, I'm not going like to read to you out of these Greek things and stuff like that. I just kind of brought them for you as visuals. So why should we not trust this text, the text of the Reformation? Because we now have older manuscripts that this new text and so-called improved text is now what? Is now based on, right? So this West Cotton Hort text, this is an American printing from what the, they printed in Britain in 1881. This does not have, or this calls into question, Mark 16, okay? And it's saying that we shouldn't really have these verses. They're not really scripture. They shouldn't really be considered in the Bible because they're simply not in the two what? Oldest and best. Now, come with me if you would to Matthew 5. 
Come over to Matthew chapter 5. This is a verse that um, I'm sure most of you know. It's used a lot when discussing the Bible issue. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, look at verse 22. Matthew chapter 5, verse 22. It says, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say unto his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Now, in that verse, what phrase is missing from the modern versions? Without a cause. Why do they leave it out? They leave it out because it's not in this what? It's not in this West Cotton Horde Greek text. It's not in the critical text, right? It's not there, right? Well, why is it not there? It's not there because it is not found in one codex. There is only one textual witness in the entire world that leaves that phrase out, and it's Codex Sinaiticus. So just because it's old, just because it's perceived to be old or believed to be old, means that if it differs from the received text, if it differ, differ, differs from the traditional text, therefore we should what? Even Codex Vaticanus has that phrase in it. So they are making a textual decision based upon the witness of only one what? Only one authority, okay? So this highlights something that I, I hope you'll at least get, and that is that they are not consistent in the, how they apply and use their own so-called rules of textual criticism, okay? And that is something that you just sort of need to be aware of. So let me talk to you first about how, what, what we're doing here and how we became aware of it. Some of you might know that in my assembly, I've been doing a very lengthy study related to inspiration and preservation. And at the end of March, well, April 2nd, my wife was going to, April 3rd, my wife went in for surgery. And that was the week I had spring break, so I don't have to work from school. And in March, I saw an advertisement on Facebook for this book right here. It's called Neither Oldest Nor Best, How the Foundational Manuscripts of the Modern Bible Translations Are Unreliable. So I saw this book advertised on the internet in late March. I knew my wife was going to be having surgery, and I said, I'm going to buy that book, and I'm going to read it while she's recovering. So the book came, the day the surgery came, we sat down, and I started re she went into surgery, and while she was recovering and stuff, I started reading it. I had it done in about two days. I was completely shocked by what the guy was saying in the book. He was saying that Codex Sinaiticus, the so-called, one of the two so-called oldest and best, was not really an old ancient fourth century codex, but was a creation of the 19th century, written by a guy named Constantine Simonides in the year 1839 to 1840 as an intended gift for the Tsar of Russia. Okay, now I went to Bible college, I took classes, I was taught the critical theory in Bible college, I was taught manuscript evidence through Grace School of Bible, and this is an idea that I had never encountered in any of that, not, not in Bible college, obviously not in Grace School of Bible, the idea that Codex Sinaiticus is not old, and not only is it not old, but that is, it is essentially a 19th century forgery is an idea that I had never considered, and I thought this guy, I'm like, yeah, right, and I, as I'm reading it, I, I almost wanted to disbelieve it, and as I read all through here, and he talks about the internal evidence, the forensic evidence, he goes through all the different uh, reasons for why uh, you might want to think that it isn't old, I got done with it, and I got on the phone, this is no lie, I, I got done with it, I caught, got on the phone, and I called Dave Reed, and I said, Dave, you got to buy this book, you got to read it, and I want you to cross-examine it from the point of view of a lawyer. Okay, that's what, isn't that what I said to you? That's what I said to him. So he, he went in, he got one, he had it read in a very short amount of time, and within about a week, we were discussing the information that was contained in this book. Once we, once we got that, we started pilfering the bibliography of this book for, for more information. That led us to, and I can't really show it to you because it's only in Kindle, that led us to a book that's only available in Kindle called The Forging of Codex Sinaiticus by a guy named William Cooper. This one here is brand new 2017. The Cooper book was written in 2015 or 16. You want to check on that for me? Then that led us to another book, Codex Sinaiticus and the Simonides Affair, written in 1983 by a guy named J.K. Uh, Elliott. So my point is... 
as we're looking at this stuff, it starts to become abundantly clear that this is not just some sort of crackpot King James only theory here, okay? There is a general, there's a scholar in 1907, J.A. Farrar, he wrote a book called Literary Forgeries. He devotes an entire chapter of literary forgeries to talking about Constantine Simonides and the authenticity of Codex Sinaiticus, okay? The British press from about 1861, I'm going to say, through about 1865, the issue of the authenticity of Codex Sinaiticus was hotly debated in the British press. This stack right here is only from one journal, the Journal of Sacred Literature and the Biblical Record. There are four, or five, four to five other newspapers and theological journals that from 18, about 1861 to 1865 were debating openly and in public whether or not Tischendorf was telling the truth about Codex Sinaiticus and whether or not the thing was actually a fourth century manuscript as Tischendorf was asserting. Okay? So I say all that to basically make a point to you. What, I'm, what we've been looking at is a reviving, if you will, of an old conversation, of an old debate that was never actually settled uh, to really anyone's satisfaction unless you were on the winning side and you, you were on the side that eventually sort of won out in this. So the point I guess I want you to see right now is the following. The Codex is potentially not a fourth century codex. Okay? Now let me say something very important about that. I don't care how old it is. I don't care if it's an old fake or a new fake. I don't care. It matters nothing to me because the, te the biblical tests of preservation when applied to the codex would tell you that it is not a witness that you should consider when identifying the line of true biblical preservation. Okay? Number one. There is, it is not attested to in a multiplicity of copies that would agree with it. Number two, it was not available. It wasn't even known until 1844. Okay? Number three, it was not in use by Bible-believing people throughout the history of the dispensation of grace. So let's just get that off the table right now. I don't care whether it was old fake or a new fake. I've never trusted it and never placed my faith in it to help me establish where the scriptures are because it fails the test of preservation from the Bible. Is everybody clear on that? Okay. That being said, if it is a 19th century creation, if it was created by Constantine Simonides in 1839-1840, then that would be absolutely catastrophic to the entire critical text theory of the New Testament. Okay. It would be absolutely catastrophic to that theory because that theory I just showed you is based upon the premise that, these, that this one, along with the Vatican's Codex, which I'll show you in a minute, that this one, along with the Vatican's Codex, are ancient, 4th century, unsealed codex, codices, which means they're in all capital letters. Okay? Some even go so far as to say that these two codices were produced in the same scriptorium at the behest of Emperor Constantine, who ordered 50 Bibles to be produced for the, the church in Constantinople. That is the standard conventional wisdom, and that is why they are suggesting in your marginal notes and so forth, and why they are making all of these changes, because of the two so-called oldest and best. Now, as I already said, I don't care how old they are, I reject them anyway, right? But if, they, if it is true that they are not what they have uh, been claimed to be, this would be absolutely catastrophic to the critical text theory. Okay. Now let me just kind of go at it from a different way. I've talked about how it's not, it's not a crackpot King James only theory, and there are some of those out there in case you're wondering. Okay. Um, so why now? Why, is this, why are there books being written in 2015, 2017? Would you get the date on that, by the way? 2016, okay. Why, why are these books being written in our day saying that this is uh, reviving this discussion about the, author, the, the age and the authenticity of the Codex? Reason number one, Codex Sinaiticus has now been fully digitized, okay? The, uni the British Museum, the uh, University of Moscow, in fact, you can see this, I believe. If you look down here, you see the par partner institutions. 
the British Library, the National Library of Russia, St. Catherine's Monastery, and Leipzig University, they, each one of these places all had a portion of the Codex. The Codex has never been ever for one second all together in one place under one roof at one time. Never. Okay? That is... It has been held in various places throughout its, throughout its known history, okay? But what happened in 2009 is they digitized it and put high-resolution photographs online, which allowed people for the first time to actually what? Look at it, okay? Um, so that's, that's the first thing I believe that has revived this discussion. The second thing is, how many of you have ever heard of Chris Pinto and Noise of Thunder Radio? Okay, amen. No one's heard of it. Perfect. Okay. Uh, Chris Pinto did a documentary video called uh, Tears Among the Wheat, and that was released in 2012. And there is a section in Tears Among the Wheat where he talks about the authenticity and the age of Codex Sinaiticus. Okay? In 2013, Chris Pinto debated James White on James White's radio program. Okay? So, Whatever he said got the ire of James White enough to the point where James White wanted to have him on his program and debate him. If you're not familiar with who James White is, James White is the guy that wrote the King James Only Controversy back in the 90s, uh, largely in response to Gail Ripplinger and some other things that were happening back in the 1990s. So in 2009, they digitized the codex. 2012, Pinto put out the video. 2013, there's the debate back and forth between Pinto and James White. Dr. Daniel Wallace from Dallas Theological Seminary has weighed in on, on this issue. And then in 2016, William Cooper wrote that book. And um, 2017, Sorensen wrote uh, Neither Oldest Nor Best. And then in addition to that, David W. Daniels from Chick Publications in 2015 put out a whole series of vlogs called Something Funny About Cyanaticus. Okay? So my point is, this, this thing is becoming, once again, a, a point of contention and discussion, okay? So those are some of the reasons why, why we're talking about it now. It's an old debate that was really never actually settled, okay? Any, any I, don't, I don't, how much time do, do we have for this? Does anybody have any questions about any of that sort of just basic information? Okay. No, that's a good question, Carl. I appreciate that. I, I, I am involved and watch um, some King... There, there's a couple King James-only groups that I watch what they're doing to uh, just stay abreast of what's being said and what's going on out there in the world of ideas about this issue. Okay, One of them is called the King James Debate Group on Facebook. There's another group that's based uh, here in the Chicago area, actually, called uh, the King James Research Council. And um, there's a couple other groups that I, that, that I watch along those lines. The guy that wrote this book, Sor David Sorensen, is a member of the King James Research Council. So I, it was not just by accident that I saw it. I'm in those groups, and I'm following what those guys are saying. Most of the time, I'm a wallflower. I just want to know what's being said, and then I, you know, will search things out and stuff like that. So um, that was sort of an active engagement on my part that I came to see or c came to know that the book had been printed. Does that answer your question? Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. <laughs> Basically, the standard party line. He didn't. You know, he was, t he was telling the same story about Tischendorf finding it in a, in a, you know, in a bin of stuff that was going to be burned. And, you know, he thinks it's something really, really great. So, that, in a nutshell, that's basically what he thinks. Yeah, he's defending it. Yeah. Are you familiar with him? Yeah. Okay. Anybody, anyone, anything on that? So, in the time that we have, I want to kind of talk to you about a few just a few things to show you, kind of talk about, about, okay, why should we believe Simonides? Why should we believe that it is not old? Simonides claimed that he created it along with the assistance of his uncle Benedict as an intended gift for the Tsar of Russia, okay? 
And he was created on Mount Athos, Greece. It's a peninsula on, uh, it's a Greek peninsula. And it was, a Greek, it was a Russian Orthodox monastery. And the idea behind it is they have some rare, valuable manuscripts at this particular monastery. Benedict is an aged monk. Uh, he had spent 35 years as a university professor. And in his career as a professor, he had accumulated a stash of different manuscripts and so forth that he wanted to get in print. There's also the idea that there was an aged monk, Gregory, who like sort of uh, left a stash of manuscripts to uh, Uncle Benedict when he died, and they want to get a printing press at the monastery so that they can start printing and, and, and uh, making the world aware of these manuscripts. So according to Simonides, what happens is him and his uncle come up, his uncle comes up with the plan, and Simonides is the calligraphist who produces the codex as an intended gift for the Tsar of Russia, okay? And that this happens between 1839 and 1840, all right? Dave, am I leaving anything out? Okay, I told him that if I left anything out, he should let me know. Um, but let's back up from that for a minute, and let's just go over some basic things, okay? You're all familiar with the story of Tischendorf, right? Tischendorf, Konstantin von Tischendorf is on a worldwide crusade to find manuscripts. And he comes to St. Catherine's Monastery in uh, the Sinai Peninsula, and he finds in a, in a big container in the middle of the monastery, he finds what he call, what he, he finds a, uh, some parchments that he thinks are old, and he asks one of the monks there, and he says that the monk, according to Tischendorf, says, well, these are things that are going to be burned, and he starts going through them, and he finds leaves of Codex Sinaiticus, and he believes he's made this great discovery, right? So Tischendorf leaves the monastery in 1844 with 43 leaves of the Codex. And he takes them back with him to Germany, and he takes them to Leipzig. That's why the University of Leipzig is a cooperating partner here, okay? And he names those 43 leaves, he names them Codex Augustanus Frederico, after the, after the King, uh, King Frederick of Saxony that financed this trip. So you do that kind of thing in the academic world, right? They would not let him take any more than that. So he goes back again in 1853, and he finds nothing. He goes back again in 1859, and that's when he makes the discovery of the bulk of the codex, okay? Because he is there under the auspices of the Tsar of Russia, he takes those things back with him to Moscow, no, not Moscow, St. Petersburg, excuse me. He takes them back to St. Petersburg, and that's where they resided in the Library of Russia until they were purchased by the British Museum in the 1930s, okay? So the, the bulk of the codex now, some 318 leaves, the biggest section of it is now in the hands of the British Museum, but it was not originally, okay? What starts to happen is Tischendorf obviously is going to start alerting the world that he's made this great what? This great discovery, right? So in 1860, 1861, it's all over the British press that this thing has been discovered. And Simonides, Constantine Simonides, he just happens to be in Britain at that time. He had been hired by um, a guy named Mayer to inspect manuscripts, a different collection of manuscripts, when this stuff starts to break and it is leaked to the press that there's somebody in Britain who is claiming to be the author of Codex Sinaiticus, okay? So, make a long story short, as soon as Simonides sees it, he says, that's not old, that's mine, I did that, and that's what touches off this lengthy debate in the British press about who the real author is and the age of the Codex, okay? Is everybody with that? Okay. So, what are some reasons why we might think we should believe Simonides? This stuff is going to be just so brief. Um, two of the distinguishing features of Codex Sinaiticus is that they include New Testament apocryphal books. Okay? So I'm actually going to come over here and I'm going to click on, I'm going to bring this back up, I'm going to click on See the Manuscript. Okay, so I, I also want you just to be able to see this, okay? So when you, when you look at, when you go here, you can actually click on all of this, and you can go to uh, the book, the chapter, the verse, 
and it will pull it up for you. You can see the photograph of, of each page. It lays it out for you here uh, in, in just like some Greek text and so forth. And then if there's an English translation available, it will tell you what it is down here in this particular box. Okay. Now, I want to show you that this codex includes two New Testament apocryphal books. You see right here, Barnabas and what? Shepherd of Hermas. Everybody sees that? Okay. So that there, in the so-called oldest and best manuscript, there are apocryphal books. Yeah. Oh, good. CodexSinaticus.org. And then you want to, if you actually want to look at it, you have to click on see the manuscript, and then it'll take you to this page. Yep. Um, these, two, these two books, uh, Hermes and Barnabas, are important for a few reasons. Okay? So I'm not, I have in here all the documentation for everything I'm going to say. So let me just also say this. I read that book. I started reading that book, the first book, on April 3rd. And since then, this is all the stuff we've got in three months. So this is not like this is not like it's hard to find stuff about this, okay, if you, if you know where to look. So Hermes and Barnabas. So you can see here that Hermes and Barnabas were in the codex, okay. In 1856, before Tischendorf finds anything, Simonides publishes a standalone copy of the Shepherd of Hermes. Okay. It contains in it Greek, it, it is believed to be at the time the first known publishing of the Shepherd of Hermas in Greek. The Shepherd of Hermas was known to have existed, there were Latin copies and that kind of thing around and available and so forth, but in 1856 he publishes the Shepherd of Hermas in Greek, and this is the first known, um, first known time that this was done, right? The following year, in 1857, Tischendorf inspects Simonides' Hermes. And he says that it is not old, it is not ancient, and that it is a relatively new creation. And his reasoning for that was basically three things. The grammar, the Greek grammar, what he called Latinisms. Latinisms were places where it, that whatever was put down in Greek had clearly been a translation of what? something that was in Latin, okay? And so Tischendorf makes a big deal that this cannot be the, an original copy of Hermes and an, not an ancient copy of Hermes for these various reasons, okay? Now, Tischendorf, when he finds the codex at St. Catherine's Monastery, uh, where's my stuff on Tischendorf? When he finds the codex at St. Catherine's Monastery uh, in 1859, what's in it? Hermes. Guess what? The Hermes that is in Codex Sinaiticus is virtually identical to the one that Simonides published in 1856 that Tischendorf has already said is not old. Does everybody see the problem? So now he's got a reverse course on what he had already said about the Hermes that about the Hermes that Simonides had published in 1856. Is everybody with that? Okay. Now again, I got all the documentation here. What's fascinating here is uh, Tischendorf wrote, if I can find it quick, I'll read it to you. He wrote a book uh, about, about his discovery. And let me ask you a question. Let's say you, let's, let's say you found it. The first place I would go would probably be like Romans or Ephesians. Okay. But this is his testimony. He says the following quote. So I'm quoting, this is uh, from Tischendorf's um, When Were the Gospels Written? An Argument of Constantine von Tischendorf with a narrative of the discovery of the Sinaitic Manuscript. Page 35, he says, uh, There by myself, so he's by himself in his sleeping chamber with the codex the first night he's got it. Okay, There by myself I, I could give way to the transport of joy which I felt. I knew I held in my hand the most precious biblical treasure in existence, a document whose age and importance exceeded all of the manuscripts which I had ever examined during the 20-year study of the subject. I cannot, uh, I, cannot, I cannot now, I confess, recall all the emotions, emotions which I felt in that exciting moment with, a, with such a diamond in my possession. 
Through my lamp, though my lamp was dim and the night cold, I sat down at once to transcribe the epistle of Barnabas. I read that to you because it tells you what Tischendorf is concerned about. He's got this thing, and where does he go first? He goes right there. Okay, now, so that leads me into Barnabas then. Dave, should I say anything else about Hermas? I mean, it's pretty much, okay. Now, when we get to Barnabas, though, things get real interesting, and I, need, I do need to share some of this with you. So I just got to find the right stuff. Now, so has Tischendorf already claimed Hermas to be a fake? In 1864, a British scholar named Donaldson put out a, a piece called A Critical History of Christian Literature and Doctrine. And Donaldson in 1864 now is calling to the reader's attention the fact that there is an agreement between the Greek published by Simonides for the Shepherd of Hermas and the Greek for the Shepherd of Hermas, that's where? In the Codex. So scholars of the day are realizing that Tischendorf has a what? Has a problem, right? That, so I'm not making this up. These guys at the time, some were realizing at the time that there's a problem in all of this for Tischendorf, okay? That, so this was from 1864. The next decade, in 1874, Donaldson puts out a second piece on the Apostolic Fathers in which he expands his treatment of the Shepherd of Hermas, but also includes comments about the Epistle of Barnabas and making some statements about something might be funny about it. Okay? So, sorry, all I have is just piles of stuff. That was in 1874 that he did that. In 1876, now let's back up for a minute. What started happening in 1870? The, translate, the revision committee started to meet in 1870, 1871. Donaldson, Donaldson is putting out books in 1874 calling into question whether how old that thing what actually is. Okay, Dave, do you remember why the Saturday review is important? Okay, I don't either, so I'm going to skip it. So the Athenium Journal, 1876 has a review in it of an edition of the Apostolic Fathers that had been written by somebody else. Not Donaldson, somebody else. So these guys are reviewing an edition of the Epistle of Barnabas that had been written by somebody else, not Donaldson. And they decide at the very end that they're going to start ripping on Donaldson. Okay? Now this is where this gets just really interesting. Okay? I'm going to read this to you. This is the kind of stuff they do. The editors are puzzled by an assertion in Donaldson's Apostolic Fathers on which we are able to throw some light. Dr. Donaldson mentions an edition of the Epistle of Barnabas printed by Simonides, okay, and containing the text as found in the Sinaitic Codex, but bearing a date of 1843. So does everybody see what's going on here? Donaldson says... Simonides already published the Epistle of Barnabas also in 1843. And that the Simonides edition of the Epistle of Barnabas is virtually the same as the Barnabas that is found in Codex Sinaiticus. Now I know some of you are already glazed over. You're like, <laughs> okay, but try to hang with me here, right? Now think about that. 1843, he does Barnabas. 1856, he does Hermas. When the Codex is found, what's in it? Both Barnabas and Hermas. The Hermas and Barnabas found in the Codex are virtually identical to the standalone copies that have already been published by Constantine Simonides. And who's the one claiming to have written the Codex? Simonides. At what point does it become impossible for, for, for that to be explainable in any other way other than Simonides had access to information and readings that nobody else had at the time that he said he had them? You following that? Uh, hopefully you are. I'm getting worried. Okay. 
But back to this, back to the Athenium, okay? Oh, I missed this important spot. Okay, so. But bearing a date of 18, 1843 in the place of publication Smyrna. The editors put out a query of the, a query of the date 1843. The date given notwithstanding, it is, it is apparent improbability is, uh, is given correctly uh, and the addition of Barnabas is one of the most curious in the many fabrications that Simonides devised. So they accuse Simonides of fabricating the 1843 Barnabas. Is everybody with that? Okay. But they don't stop there. The Greek went to the trouble at his, uh, of printing at his own expense an edition of the Epistle of Barnabas for the very purpose of putting the date 1843 upon it. So they accuse him of, at his own expense, printing it, the Epistle of Barnabas in Greek, so that he could put the date 1843 on it himself. Okay? Then they go further than that. He wished to make people believe that he had manuscripts of the entire Barnabas before Tischendorf found his famous codex. So you see what's going on here. Okay? The title page of the strange document states that the text of the Epistle of Barnabas is based on seven manuscripts. In the copy in which Simonides gave to, uh, gave to the writer of this article, he had altered, he says he alters a few words, it gives a few words in Greek um, in, in the preface. Simonides was not content with, the print, with printing the text. He produced an, an estest, a testation of its genuineness, a date of his, in his edition of a newspaper of Smyrna published in 1843, containing a long review of the work. You notice that it didn't tell you the name of the newspaper. So they're saying he printed it and put 1843 on it. He did it at his own expense. He fabricated a newspaper article from 1843 claiming that he actually, reviewing, reviewing the, the, the Barnabas and proving that he actually wrote it in 1843, and they made that up too. Okay? Is everybody with that? The paper... And the print of the newspaper looked uncommonly fresh, and on subsequent inquiries at Smyrna, it was found that no such newspaper had ever existed, and that the printer whose name appeared at the bottom of it was also entirely unknown. They didn't tell you the name of the paper. The name of the paper was Star of the East. I got a book here, The Report uh, of Smyrna, and this was written in 1856, and it says, talking about Smyrna, of the educational development of middle class of any population, the character of their favorite journals may be taken as a tolerably good indication. Of the four newspapers published in Smyrna, three are Greek, one is French, and of the three Greek, the Athenium, uh, the, the Athelium, excuse me, and the journal, the other two are the Star of the East. Independent confirmation that the Star of the East newspaper what? existed in Smyrna, Turkey. Travels in Greece and Turkey. This one's from 1863. Smyrna seems the headquarters of the, of the missionaries who have established a religious newspaper there called the Star of the East. But on further inquiry, they couldn't confirm that it had ever what? Existed. Here's a copy of the Star of the East newspaper. From eight, this one's from 1843. I wrote to the Greek, I wrote to two Greek universities via email. I wrote to a Greek university in Thessalonica, interestingly enough, uh, University of Aristotle in, Thess at, uh, in Thessalonica, and then another one in Athens. Asked for the call number, and there is the article from the Star of the East newspaper from 1843 reviewing Simonides' Epistle of Barnabas. The British press was lying. Anybody surprised by that? Okay. The other university sent us something that we never expected to find, and I only printed the first few pages, but I have in, front, I have in my hands the Greek copy from 1843 of Simonides' Epistle of Barnabas. Okay, I've got the whole thing in a, in a, in a PDF. Okay. Now let me tell you why this is important. I'm going to go to Barnabas. Let me 
go to chapter 2 or 3, I can't remember which. Just give me a minute, please. Dave, do you remember a page where there was handwritten um, notes on it? Oh, that's a good point. Yes, thank you for reminding me of that. So the other thing you need to know here is this. Among other things, but this is one thing. You know what this is? This is the end of the book of Revelation. Okay? You know what this is here? This is the beginning of the Epistle of Barnabas. They are on the same sheet on the same leaf, and the Epistle of Barnabas was part of the original Codex of Sinaiticus. It was not added later. Okay? Now, the one thing I could spend a lot of time monkeying around trying to find it is examples of marginal notes. Okay? So I'm just going to tell you about it, and if later on I could probably show it for you. But here, here's why this is important. Okay? In Sinaiticus, this is the main text of Barnabas. Okay? Let me just go to one more. I don't like not being able to show you this. I don't like for you to take my word for stuff because then I'm like some of these other clowns that are out there. And I don't want to I don't want to do that. But I also don't want to Oh, there's one. Okay. Whew. This thing's a little bit touchy. Do you see right there that there is a marginal note right there? Okay? So, if you take the base text of Barnabas found in Codex Sinaiticus, and you add the marginal corrections, they equal virtually identically what Simonides had already published in 1843. Okay? What's that? This, uh, that is in chapter, that's just chapter 8 of Barnabas. Okay? Does everybody follow that? How is Simonides publishing a standalone copy of Barnabas that matches virtually identically with what's in Codex Sinaiticus with the marginal notations if he doesn't know what's in that thing? Okay? So the evidence here is getting, at, at some point you have to ask yourself, at what point is this guy what? Telling the truth. Because two of the distinguishing, two of the, 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 the greatest distinguishing features of Codex Sinaiticus, Simonides has already published in standalone editions before anybody even found the thing. Okay? Dave, anything else on that? <laughs> yeah, John. Again, that's significant because it means that whoever created it did not add it later. They joined it hard to the end of the book of Revelation. So they were insinuating, whether they believed it or not, they were at least insinuating that it was equal to, in terms of Scripture, with the book of Revelation. Yeah, okay. If I could add one thing. Yep. What it does is they can't say the Barnabas of Sinaiticus was added later. It was with the original. Yeah. And since it matches the 1843 version, how do you get around that? Yes. Yep. So, so, that, that, so the reason I'm spending all the time talking about this is because these are, you read these books, you read Sorensen, and you read Cooper, and you listen to uh, the vlogs that David W. Daniels did, and they are full of conspiracy theories. Okay? The Jesuits are doing this, and they're hiding under every rock, and they're doing all this stuff, right? And so what happens is, by the time they get to a debate with James White, all James White is doing is ripping on them for all their dumb conspiracy theories, and he never deals with what's really important and what the real facts are. What's really important factually is this stuff. I don't care how it happened. The reality is that it's there, and you've got to figure out a way that you're going to what? Explain that it's there. So to, to convolute it and all of that stuff, 
allows people to avoid the, avoid the bulk of the point. Okay? Now, um, okay, yeah, well, my wife says we need to eat dinner, so I don't know. Okay. Do you want, are we still on board? With, I mean, I know, uh, this is like coming up with like a, a, a trunk and a truck and just dumping stuff on you, but I want to go back to something else then. So I told you already that there is no known provenance of this manuscript before the year 1844. Okay? When Tischendorf finds the first part at St. Catherine's Monastery. So I have, this is from a book called Traveling Through Sinai, I believe. And it has accounts and descriptions of people that had been to St. Catherine's Monastery and what they found in the library. Okay? So this first one is from a guy named William Turner, and it's from 1815, okay? He says the following, to my, to my inquiries after manuscripts in a library, the priests answered <clears throat> that they had only three Bibles, okay? And I took their word for it the more readily as uh, Poke, or Pokey, I, I don't know how else to say his name, states that there are no rare manuscripts. So this guy's saying this in 1815, and he's referring to a guy named Poke, okay? So, did some research. I found a description of the East and other countries, volume the fifth, observations on Egypt, written by a guy named Poke in, 17, in the 1740s, 100 years before Tischendorf finds anything, okay? This guy... This guy has got drawings of the monastery. He's got maps of the topography. He's got all of this stuff that he includes in here. But the part I want to read to you is on page 153 when he talks about pilgrims at the convent. This is a very important point, folks. Okay? When pilgrims arrive at the convent, let's just stop there. What does that tell you about St. Catherine's Monastery? St. Catherine's Monastery is a pilgrimage site, which means that through, through, through much of church history, religious pilgrims are going where? To St. Catherine's. And they're coming and going out of St. Catherine's, right? So if there's this great, wonderful Uncial Codex that's hiding somewhere, are there people moving through there that might have possibly seen it before 1844? Okay? So he says here, well, when pilgrims arrive at the convent, <clears throat> a cloyer or lay brother is appointed to attend to them to prepare their provisions in a place apart, which is uh, uh, served in their chamber, and they are shown all the chapels and offices of the convent. The library. So are they being, are they given tours of it? Are they going through the library? Okay. Um, they are shown all the chapels and offices of the convent. The library where there are a few manuscripts, but I saw none that were rare. So there's a guy, he's there, in the, in the 1740s, says he finds nothing what? This guy, in 18, this, this guy Turner in 1815, he says, he asks how many Bibles they have, he says they have how many? Three, and he says there's nothing what? There's nothing rare. Eighteen forty four. so 1844, Tischendorf supposedly finds what? He supposedly finds the codex, right? The year after that, in, 1850, in, 18, in 1845, a Russian Orthodox Archimandrite named Porfiry Uspensky, he travels to St. Catherine's Monastery, and he says the following, okay? So pay attention. The best Greek manuscripts are stored in the prior cells. Now think, pay attention, right? Why? Tischendorf has gone. He's left with 43 leaves and made a big deal about it. So now the monks take their best manuscripts and they do what? They hide them away. Okay, now I'm going to go on. The best Greek manuscripts are stored in the prior cells. There are only four of them. In 1815, there were how many? Three. Now in 1845, there's how many? 
Hmm. There are four of them, and they are very precious for their antiquity, rarity, and handwriting features, their content, their elegance, and the beautiful faces of the saints, and the entertaining drawings and paintings. Now listen to this. The first manuscript containing the Old Testament, which is incomplete, and the entire New Testament with the epistle of St. Barnabas and the book of Hermas. What's he describing? He's describing Codex Sinaiticus with the epistle of Hermas, okay, was written on the finest white parchment in four columns on a long, wide sheet. Letters of the manuscript reveal, and he goes into talking about that, but Four columns on a long, wide sheet. Notice that he said on fine white what? Now, now we need to get into just a little bit of a forensic evidence here. Okay? The pages on the left are the pages that Tischendorf originally took with him to Germany in 1844. The pages on the right are the pages that were found in 1859. Notice anything? You notice anything? Okay. This, this image here is a composite photo, and you can see it better on this one, unfortunately, but this image here is a composite photo of every leaf in the codex. Do you notice anything? Do you notice that there, if you count these up, guess how many light ones there are? About 44, 43. Okay. How is it that the pages that he originally took with him to Germany don't match the color of the pages that he took with him to Moscow in 1859. Someone yellowed or darkened these pages. If you don't believe that, I will read to you, and I'm sure by now, hopefully you... I have two testimonies here. One from New Testament Textual Criticism, written by a guy named J.A. McLaren, and this was written in, I believe, uh, 1913 describes the snow white vellum that Codex Sinaiticus was written on even in the year 1913. It totally depends on which part of the codex you saw, what color you think the pages are, okay? Now, let me show you this. This is this is a contiguous page. So if I take if I take a book and I just open it like this, this page is this color and this page is that color. right here on the same page okay I mean you can go on and on here just all these examples here of contiguous pages not matching now I'm gonna stop on this one because I can use it to make another point maybe not so this thing are there pilgrims coming and going out of St. Catharines for hundreds of years does anybody notice any great Uncial Codex in the library before 1844? There's testimony across, across centuries and decades of information about there only being three Bibles. When the Bible shows up, there's all this goofiness about it being divided into pieces, about the, the pages not matching, all this stuff. You've got Simonides claiming that, that Tischendorf must have darkened the Codex because it didn't, didn't look the way that it, that it was supposed to look. You have just all these things going on uh, regarding to its age. And again, uh, that, that's pretty much all I, I want to say about that. I, I wanted to cover Hermes and Barnabas because I think those are the, the real big smoking guns. I wanted you to see some of the forensic evidence. It's going to take me too long to find it, but there are examples of where the scribe wrote around wormholes. So in other words, the wormhole was already in the parchment when the scribe put the, the writing on it. Okay? There's just tons of these sorts of things. Okay? So the last thing I want to talk to you about um, before I make a concluding point is 
I want to talk to you about why it's not best. So let's say Simonides is a liar. Let's say he's deceived everybody. Let's say it is old. Just because it's old, does that mean you should trust it? Okay. So I'm going to go to, where's Ezra? What is it, First Chronicles? Um, the one where they skip from, the one where they skip from First Chronicles, um, Just give me one second. I can't find it in my notes. So I'll just tell you about it. In the Old Testament, the scribe is copying, and he gets the first chronicles. Um, oh, I found it, 1917. Good. You'll notice 1 Chronicles is in here twice, but that's not a problem. It's the best. It's in here twice. But 2 Chronicles isn't in here at all. So I want 1 Chronicles 19, and I want verse 17. It's going to be hard to approximate it in the photograph, but if you look close, okay, does everybody see on this, on this window right here that you have, this is 1 Chronicles 19, verse 17, okay? Does everybody see that? And then if you arrow down, you'll see that all of a sudden you see this 9-9. Nine, nine. On the same page, on the same line, the scribe skipped from First Chronicles seven, from First Chronicles seventeen nineteen, all the way to Ezra nine nine. Doesn't fix it, doesn't correct it, just leaves it and moves on. The entire codex is missing the end of her, uh, end of for, parts of First Chronicles are in it twice. Okay. Second Chronicles is totally left out. The first ha the first part of Ezra is totally left out. But you're supposed to accept this as the best. Okay? Let me just sh share a few other things with you, okay? Um, you can also do this by choirs. So I just want to find one page. I just need to make one point. I'm going to go to choir 46. If you follow along on your computer, I, know, I see some of you are doing that. I want fully a one, and I want the recto side, which is the, the front side. You see what's going on on this page? You see all this overwriting right here? It's overwriting. You see how the rest of it is faded? Okay. Um, Go to choir 36. What time is it? Five o'clock. All right. Choir 36, folia 8, verso. You see that page? Somebody want to tell me what on that page is scripture? What scripture on that page? Is this scripture? Are the marginal notes scripture? This thing is a mess, folks. This thing is a train wreck. It is an absolute mess, okay? Not only that, let me just go through. What is it missing, okay? It's missing all but four chapters of Genesis. It's missing all of Exodus. 
It's missing all but three chapters of Leviticus, all but 12 chapters of Numbers, all but five chapters of Deuteronomy, three chapters of Joshua, seven chapters of Judges. It's missing all of Ruth, all of 1 and 2 Samuel, all of 1 and 2 Kings. It has parts of Chronicles twice. It's missing the first eight chapters of Ezra. It's missing all of Lamentations after chapter 22, verse 20. It's missing all of Ezekiel, all of Daniel, all of Hosea, all of Amos, and all of Micah. It's missing 11 entire books and most of six more. A whole quarter of the Bible is missing from Codex Sinaiticus. Okay? Yeah. But what does it have in it? It's got Barnabas. It's got Hermas. For those of you that are into your Old Testament Apocrypha, it's got Tobit. It's got Judith. It's got First and Fourth Maccabees. It's got Wisdom of Solomon. It's got Sirach. It's the best. There are, tw there, there are 73,000 corrections. That averages 30 corrections per page. And it is the most corrected manuscript known to exist in history. But we should trust it to take without a cause out of Matthew 5.22. Okay. So I have pretty much have accomplished generally what I wanted to do. Let me just say a few things. Um, this is going to be an ongoing thing. Dave and I have discussed it, and I've everything that I've ever looked at from a more of a historical point of view, I've never encountered anything that's been like this. This has been, this has really been a real, um, tr a real ride looking at this stuff. Okay. I just want to end, end with directing you to a few resources, and then allowing maybe just a couple questions. I don't know if you have questions or not, but. The, you could read. You could get neither oldest nor best. You could get the Kindle book. Okay. You could look at um, uh, David. You could search Chick Publications in YouTube and find David Daniel's vlog series on something funny about Sinaiticus. Okay. And then I've put together at our assembly. I taught in Sunday school. I finished it two days ago Sunday. I've got a six a six part study that I've called. A Tale of Two Constantines, Rethinking Codex Sinaiticus. And I go through all this stuff a lot slower and give all of the documentation and all of that sort of thing that I don't really have time to get into here. Okay? Let me just say this. You know how Reagan had a foreign policy statement where he said, um, Trust but verify. Where I'm at with most King James, pro King James literature, is I'm in the category of verify then trust. Okay? Because this book and all the other books, in my opinion, have serious problems and, and, and things that you don't want to just accept this stuff uncritically. You need to think through it and you need to check out what's going on and that they're actually telling you the truth. Okay, and I would say that basic for almost all of the stuff that I've read on this topic. Okay, but um, the resources are out there. I would obviously say you should start with my stuff, um, but I guess I'm a little bit biased. But it's there if you want to know more about it. Okay, now let me just end with this. The, why is, we didn't even get to talk about Vaticanus. You also need to know. that all, in 2015, all of Codex Vaticanus has been digitized. Before 2015, virtually no one in 150, 100, oh, nearly 150, 160 years of textual criticism had ever actually saw Codex Vaticanus with their own eyes. They were working off of facsimile reprints and never actually examined the thing themselves. The same thing with Codex Sinaiticus. Yet, Westcott and Hort, they want you to believe that on the basis of these two witnesses, they have the authority to change
to change the text of the Protestant Reformation. I said this morning, you want to know when the Re when, when did Reformation 2.0, the resurgence of Pauline truth, fizzle out? When they took this and put it on the shelf and said, this is now the Word of God. Okay. All right, I will stop now. I... I know it's bothering me because I know how much stuff I've like left on the table, but we'll have to live with it. Yeah. So a lot of these claims that he was the author of the text. Correct. He he based the text on. He based the text on the manuscripts that Uncle Benedict had compiled and, co and collected over his 35-year career. So Simonides is about a 20-year-old guy when he does this in 1840, 1830, 1830, 1830 but he's basically just copying what his uncle puts in front of him, largely. His uncle that was collecting. Yes. Yes. And that's one of the reasons, uh, James White and, and those guys, they will say, well, you know, Simonides, he's only 19 or 20. There's no way he could have done it. And they'll say, well, there's no way he could have done the whole thing in, you know, a year, about a year, from 1839 to 1840. But they'll believe that Tischendorf, when he takes the thing from the monastery, and brings it to Cairo, that he can copy the whole thing in three months. And they'll believe that. But, but there's no way Simonides could have done it in one year. It doesn't make sense. The arguments break down, yeah. How do you spell Simonides? S-I-M-O-N-I-D-E-S. <laughs> like Simonides. Like, yeah. Simonides. Do you have a comment? Do I know you? No. Oh. <laughs> What language is the Sinaitic, his Old Testament, in? and did, you already kind of referred to it, did Westcott and Hort ever see the original Sinaitic as Question number one, what language is the Old Testament in? Codex Vaticanus, it is in Greek. Codex Sinaiticus, it is in Greek. Now you better let that do some trips in your head. I thought... I thought that translations were not capable of, of, of expressing the inspired Word of God. But the two so-called oldest and best witnesses contain Old Testament translations from Hebrew into Greek. Chew on that one for a while. What was your other question? Oh. Westcott and Hort never saw either codex a day in their life. All they saw were facsimile reprints that had been prepared by Tischendorf. And the only reason anybody thinks it's old, Codex Sinaiticus is old, is because of the paleolog paleography is the science of handwriting, because Tischendorf said it was and everybody believed him. That's it. It has never been tested. They have never done a forensic test. They've never done a forensic analysis on the age of the parchment, the pigments and the inks. Any of that stuff has never been conducted on Codex Sinaiticus. The British Museum had a test scheduled for 2015 and they canceled it. It's my personal belief that they're scared to death about what a forensic test of that codex is going to turn up. Okay, yes. Yeah, the two witnesses that he produced are the actual printing of it and then the newspaper article. I don't know the answer to that right now. Um, do you remember reading anything about that? Yeah, published. This is so close to Sinaiticus, they have to somehow make it later. But the newspaper clearly exists, and the, type, the, the article exists, so I, I don't know what better proof there could be than that. It's a secular source saying, hey, we need to announce as news that Simonides published this. 
So there's nobody that we know of that could have said, that said anything about it. But I will add to that. It's not, that's not all we have. Just one minute there. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm not going to be able to find it now, but I have three other catalog listings of other books listing different printings of the Epistle of Barnabas, all noting an 1843 printing by Simonides. So there is, there is extra, I don't want to say extra biblical, that's not the right word, but there's, there's extra witness outside of those guys to say that, that, that acknowledging that there was an edition printed in 1843 by Simonides. That the critics ignored. Yes. Yeah. Wasn't there a, a, uh, another man that verified that, <coughs> that came to Simonides? There was another man that came to Simonides. In the British press, there's another guy named Kalanikos who comes to Simonides' defense and saying he was there, saying that he saw him do it, and, and all of that. And then, of course, what do they say about him? <laughs> what do you got out of person? What do they say about him? They say he's what? That he's lying, that he's a fraud, um, and all that sort of thing. So, it's amazing how I can actually find this stuff. A collation of Athos codices, the shepherd, no, that's not the one I want. Never mind, I just spoke too soon. I have here, um, it's Brandon, right? I have in my possession uh, two catalogs of the, here they are right here, a catalog of manuscripts on Mount Athos prepared by the Greek scholar Spirito Lampros that note um, the existence of Kalanikos, the existence of Simonides, and the existence of Uncle Benedict all being on Mount Athos in 1839-1840. Okay, so again, there is extra proof for that too, right? <laughs> I don't want to. I, I do appreciate your your patience on this stuff. Um, are there any other any other questions? So I have had direct contact with Chris Pinto. I've corresponded with Chris Pinto. I've corresponded with Stephen Avery, who is an associate of uh, David Daniels. Um, I have not had direct contact with um, Sorensen, and then I've also corresponded with. The, the um, university, the research librarians at the two universities in uh, Greece. So what is their response? Um, <laughs> my, my fundamental problem, Richard, with a lot of it is, again, it, they, the, those, those men are, are much more conspiratorial in their approach. And it's been my contention that that's not beneficial and I have asked, I have, I've, I haven't really said anything as much as I've been asking them questions. What about this? What about this? What about this? And sometimes they've been helpful, sometimes they haven't been. Well, that was going to be my other question. Was, and I, I would <clears throat> like for you to speak to the wackiness that's out there in the King James camp in that regard. I mean, you need to, you, you folks need to understand, you can't just trust everything somebody says because they said a king game. So if you, my, I, don't, I don't mean to throw off on them, but I, I mean, it, it, something like this, we need to be able to understand, we just can't pick up stuff just because somebody, we like something of what somebody said. Right. So I've come, this, this is my personal, private, subjective conviction. You don't have to agree with me if you don't want to. We have, allowed, we have allowed the Acts 2 Baptists to take the lead on the Bible issue. And we have followed them in a lot of ways sometimes very uncritically. Okay? Now, again, I'm not trying to make anyone mad at me. I'm just telling you my observation. It's my opinion that we've done that in a way that we never would have let them do that on any other point of doctrine. What we need to do is we need to take this issue back and we need to refine this issue from the point of view of mid-ex Pauline dispensational truth. Amen. And I think that needs to be done and that is something that I'm very concerned with personally in my ministry as something that is really on my mind to do. Amen. So I don't, you cannot just trust what you're reading in all these books. Okay? You've got to verify then trust. 
Can we have their hand up? Yeah. That was the question that I asked before. I know this isn't something flipping that you do overnight. Any possibility that you would do a book on this kind of stuff? Dave? Um, We've thought about it. We're talking about it. From the rate division. Yeah, we're, ta we're talking about that. Uh, not just about just Simonides, but other things too. Um, but, you know, there's only so much time. So, yeah. I was just going to mention that I read uh, David Sorensen's book, The Catch Up, The Unclean Thing. And he's a, a soft spoken guy from, he graduated from Pensacola Christian College. And um, he's very approachable. I like Sor. I've read that book too. I have that in my library. It's, it, it, it's, it's a pretty good book, but I'm just gonna. If I'm gonna, if you ask me personally, what book on the King James issue would you recommend to somebody? I cannot unequivocally recommend really any one book to anybody that doesn't have a bunch of junk in it. That doesn't have a bunch of either bad attitude, terrible research, and 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 that kind of thing. I'm sorry, but even the even the Sorensen book has, is is very questionable to me on the the use of sources and how he's getting information. Okay, and so yeah, it's I think it's a problem. You cannot just trust what you're reading in all these books. You have to be able to check it out. And let me say one more thing: the internet allows you every single one of these things we pulled for free off the internet and put them in a Dropbox file. All of it. Start, you got to learn how to use the internet to conduct the research. Because you can get all of, all these papers, all these things I have up here, I got for free off the internet. Only, the only thing I paid for are the books. The rest of it was all available for free. So these things are researchable, they are checkable, they are able to be verified, and they are able to be proven out. Okay? Thanks for giving me your time.